Welcome this morning, Dr. George Mundy. My brother in Christ, my friend, my buddy, my confidant. Confidant. Uh, he and I have, uh, he used this term years ago with me, iron sharpeneth iron. And uh, he certainly has sharpened my life many a time. And uh, he loves the Lord. Let me say this, he's ate up. <laughs> in a good way. Ate up with the Lord. And uh, he's not arrogant about it or anything like that. He's got a sweet spirit. And I know that God's going to give us something this morning because uh, God usually gives something to Brother George. Mm -hmm. Brother, you come and you uh, minister our hearts and look forward to the Holy Spirit just using you. I love you, my brother. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for coming, even though you, many of you knew I was going to be speaking this morning. I don't know if you're gluttons for punishment or Brother Tim just was mad at you and poked me off on you, but anyway, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I always enjoy preaching here because you're an easy folk to preach to. You're open-minded and you're receptive and you always seem like you're hungry. And you know when you fix up a good meal, you just love giving it to people that are hungry. Amen. And I pray this morning that God has put something together that He wants me to share that will be a blessing to your hearts. I was singing that song just a minute ago, and, and I just thought how God puts things together. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. And the thought for my message this morning is the certainty of the Christian. If you have your Bibles this morning, you'd like to find my jumping off point, or turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 19. Revelation 1, 19. It says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, there's certain things God wants His children to know. And uh, uh, so they don't have to live their lives in fear and doubt and confusion. And Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. Knowing is key and it's all important. When you ask many professing believers if they know that they're saved or if they know they're going to heaven when they die, oftentimes they'll respond, well, I sure hope so. But you see, that isn't good enough if you want to live a life of peace and victory. Once a little boy's dog had a litter of puppies, he put them up for sale after a, a short bit. He had a chair, a box of puppies, and a sign that read, Puppies for Sale, one dollar each. He positioned himself on the front lawn close to the street. One afternoon, a man was driving by, driving by and he saw the sign. And he thought to himself, you know, I should stop and buy one of those puppies for my children. I know they would love to have a dog. But he thought it through quickly and he decided not to and just kept driving. He thought of all that would entail. The next morning as he drove by again, he also thought it over and he repented and he thought, I should do that. I should get a puppy for my children. They would just love a dog. And so on the way home that afternoon, he thought, he'd, he, thought he would stop and buy one of those puppies for his children. But that afternoon when he stopped, he noticed the sign had been changed. It said, uh, puppies for sale, $2 each. He, of course, questioned the little boy why the pups were only $1 yesterday and now today when he decided to buy one, all of a sudden they were $2. The little boy explained, yesterday they didn't have their eyes open, but today they do and everyone knows puppies are worth more if they have their eyes open. <laughs> and might I add that everyone knows believers are surely worth more if they have their eyes open. The prophet of old scolded Israel for having their eyes closed and purposely living in darkness. John said, the light has come and we've seen it. Jesus said, when you're seeing the truth clearly, then your life is surely worth more. 
He said the eye is the light of the body. It's where the light gets in. But if you live squinty-eyed, then you purposely live in darkness. There's some things God wants us to know because true knowledge sets you free and God wants you to be free. So how are we to know these things? Well, thankfully God had them written down for us so we could fact check anytime we wanted to and as often as we wanted to. Jesus told John to write about the things, uh, about what was, what is, and what is to come. Now Paul's mind was on the same page as, as Jesus' mind for he wrote in Romans uh, those things, uh, of those things in much more detail. In Romans 1 through 3, Paul wrote about what it was like before Christ came into our life. In chapter 4 through 8, he wrote about how things are with Christ in our life. And then in chapter 9 through 11, he wrote about how things will be when uh, uh, Israel gets their eyes open to who re Jesus really is. And then in the rest of the book, Paul writes some practical applications drawn from the things, the truths that he shared with us. So how is it we can know these things? If God has plainly declared it in His Word, then we can know it. John, in his little epistle of 1 John, uses the word know 26 different times in that little five-page letter. In 1 John 5, 13, John said, These things have been written that you may know. However, Paul goes into much more detail about uh, what is vital for us to know. So let's look at what Paul wrote about those things in Romans chapter 4 through chapter number 8. Now before we get into what Paul wrote about the past, the present, and the future, let us first touch upon what Paul, uh, Paul also wrote about knowing. Paul uses some form of the word know in chapter 5 and verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3, 6, 6, 6, 9, 6, 16, 7, 1, 7, 14, 7, 18, 8, 22, and in 8, 28. Now Paul's not writing about uncertain things that cannot be known. For example, when he wrote Romans 8, 28, about God working all things together for the believer's good, he prefaced it by saying, and we know, we know. We don't have to guess or hope. We rest assured because we know. This overarching theme of knowing covers everything that Paul writes about in this book. Paul applies this knowledge to the three areas that Jesus told John to write about. Write about what we know about the past, what we know about the present, and what we know about the future. We're not guessing and hoping. God knows the past. He knows the present, and He knows the future, and He told the writer what to write down. People fuss about whether Moses was able to write uh, uh, the, the, the books, the first five books of the Old Testament, and some argue that Moses wasn't alive then. Well, even if he hadn't been alive then, it wouldn't matter. He wasn't alive at creation, but he wrote about creation. Why? Because God was in the past, and God knows what was in the past, and he told his man what to write down. So he said, write about the past. Write about how things used to be before you were in Christ. And so Paul writes about the past, what was, what used to be. Now, he's writing to believers and he's talking to believers and he's telling believers how it used to be before you came to Christ. Uh, Romans 6.6 6 says, When we were sinners, we're not sinners anymore. We're saints and the children of God. But we used to be sinners until we met Christ, and Christ forgave our sins. When we were, it says in past tense, without strength, but we're not without strength anymore. Uh, those that are in Christ are strengthened by His strength. Romans 6, 8 said, while we were sinners, we used to be sinners, but no more. Chapter 6 and verse 10, when we were the enemies of God, we're not enemies of God now. We're members of His body, His flesh and bone. We're children, we're part of His family. Romans 6, 12, death passed 
unto all men in that all have sinned. But death has been lifted off of us because we've been given the life of Christ. Romans 6, 14 says you were under the sentence of death. Romans 6, 18 says you were judged and condemned. But Paul's, uh, John said, yeah, Paul said, uh, John said, John 3, uh, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Now this is written to believers because you'll notice Paul often uses the word we. But if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, then this decri describes not only your past, but your present state before God and the state which you will remain in until and unless you invite Christ to come into your heart and live and receive His gift of forgiveness for your sins and His gift of eternal life. Paul writes of the things that are as, uh, as past history for believers or as things were before Christ and then he compares them to the, how things are now that we're in Christ. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now Paul explains, explains in Romans 5 that all men were separated uh, from God through the fall of Adam. Adam was the father of the entire human race and when he became fallen, then he passed that fallen condition on to all of his descendants much like a father can pass on defective genes to his own children. Now listen to this. Listen closely. It's not that a person has to do something to become separated from God. He rather was born in that condition. And in order for that relationship between God and man to be restored, then a man must choose to trust God to restore it. He must believe in Jesus and what Jesus did on man's part to repair the damage uh, done in the fall. On the cross, Jesus purchased back for us all that Adam had lost and more. And the Bible plainly declares, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now that's the state of all men who are not in Christ. They are born fallen and they will die in a fallen condition and live eternally without God if they never come uh, to be reconciled to Him. And the Bible plainly declares, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so they will die fallen if they never come to acknowledge and trust in Jesus as their Savior. <clears throat> That's the things that are past. Then he said, right of the things that are present. Now, the, that's the things which are. That's how things are now. Now, to this point, uh, Paul often, uh, to, to, to point to the present, Paul often uses the word now because now refers to the present. Romans 5 uh, verse 9, Now justified. That's the state we're in now. We've been justified before God. We are justified. We're not doing something to try to become justified. We are justified. Verse 5, nurse, verse number 11 says, We have now received the atonement. 619, because you are God's now yield to God. Romans 6, 22, now being made free from sin. What's the condition of the believer now? He's free from sin. Chapter 7, 6, now are we delivered from the law. Where's the Christian? Under the law, trying to perform? No, he's now, right now, he's been delivered. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Romans 7, 20. Now if I do that that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Romans 8, 21. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 9. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Uh, now highlights the present but so also does any verb that is in the present tense, such as are, is, have, and etc. When Paul says, now are we the children of God, it's present tense. We're not trying to become the children of God. We're not working to gain God's favor. Now are we. It doesn't say we shall be. 
He states that we are justified, that we have the atonement, that we have the Spirit of God within, that we are dead to sin, that our old man is crucified, we are sanctified, all things are working together for our good. We are the children of God. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You'll find present tense verbs used in chapter 4, 7, 5, 1, 5, 5, 5, 9, 5, 10, 5, 11, 5, 16, 6, 2, 6, 6, 6, 7, 6, 8, 6, 15, 6, 18, 6, 22, 7, 6, 8, 1, 8, 9, 8, 10, 8, 14, 8, 15, 8, 16, 8, 28, and 8, 37. Now, this sums up a part of what we are and what we now have in Christ. Everything Christ did for us to make us right with God and to restore us to full fellowship and communion with God and all that He did to restore us to the best life available this side of heaven, all of that is in the present tense. It is your present possession in Christ. You are sanctified. You are rich. All things are yours. We are the children of God. We are made the righteousness of God in Christ. You are complete in Him. Paul isn't talking here about heaven to go to. He's talking about heaven we can live in, in the here and now, on this earth, in this flesh, and in this life. That's the things that are. Then he said right about the future are the things that shall be or the things that are to come. The Lord of the feast said to Jesus, you've saved the best wine till the last. Uh, we're talking about some good stuff here, but isn't, this isn't all of it. You haven't received yet everything that God has for you. Write about your future. Paul covers, covers several topics under this heading. In Romans 5, 9, it says, Believers shall be saved from the wrath to come. That tells me that no one who's a believer will be around on earth when God's wrath is revealed from heaven uh, in the tribulation period or thereafter. Romans 5.10 says that when judgment comes, it will be His life, not our good life, that has saved us. Romans 5.17 tells us that we shall reign in life but one Christ Jesus. Are you reigning your life right now? Well, it's not an automatic thing. It will be in the future, but you can reign in life now by Christ. But you must choose to continuously trust in Jesus moment by moment if that's to be your life here and now. Romans 5.21 says, Grace shall reign through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace not only reigns over the here and now, but it'll be grace that reigns in heaven throughout all eternity with God. Romans 7, 24, it is Jesus who will in the future free us from this body and give us a new body like His own. Romans 8, 11, it is Jesus who will quicken our mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in us. It's not that I can conquer uh, this flesh by myself. Romans 8, 18 says there is glory to be revealed in us, not shame to be revealed at His appearing, but glory. Romans 8, 21 says we shall be delivered from the corruption in our flesh. One of these days we'll be delivered even from the very temptation of sin. Romans 8, 23 says we're waiting for the full adoption, our full inheritance of our adoption. Uh, Romans 8, 23 says how shall he not freely give us all things after he's freely given us his own son? Are you presently possessing your possessions in Christ? Romans 8.35 tells us that we shall never be separated from God's love for us. Nowhere in the future. And Romans 8.39 reassures us that nothing in the future, uh, no, uh, no place, no time, no circumstance, no living creature will ever be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Our future is secure. Now, in case you're thinking by, thinking by now, wow, how could it be any better than this? But wait, 
There's more. There's much more, in fact. Paul now highlights all of this. Now, there's the cake, and cake is good, but now Paul's going to put some icing on the cake. And he does this by adding to this the words more and the words much more to these statements. In Romans 5, 9, we have the much more of justification being now justified. We shall much more be saved by His life. There's the much more, uh, uh, so much more about justification than our finite minds are able uh, to comprehend. Justification means much more than just mercy. It means much more than just forgiveness. It means much more than redemption. It means much more than God just declaring us innocent. It means much more than just escaping the wrath to come. It means much more than God just looking the other way. It means much more than not not ju just not being cast away from God. It means much more than not just being God's enemy and an enemy anymore. Justification uh, means much more uh, than God just declaring in us innocent. That is a negative state. God rather declares us righteous, and that's a positive state. Justification means much more than just being loved by God. It means being loved by God equally as He loves His own Son, Jesus Christ. Next, we find the much more of reconciliation, Romans 5.10. Reconciliation means much more than just being at peace with God. We often are at peace with someone because we've settled our differences with them. But that does not necessarily mean that we love them and do good things for them. Romans 5.10 says, Now that our differences have been settled by Jesus, we've been reconciled to God. There is much more than that because He now lives within us. His life within us saves us from a wasted and useless life. His life within us saves us from the destruction and continuous disaster. His life within us enables us to enter into all of God's goodness for our life. His life within us opens up the windows of heaven to us while we're still on earth. His life within us brings us before a throne of grace instead of a throne of judgment. His life within us brings us mercy instead of judgment. His life within us brings us all of these things. In Him, we are the children of God. In Him, we reign in life. In Him, we're more than conquerors. In Him, God freely gives us all things. Then there's the much more of grace. Oh, how could there be much more than grace? <laughs> how are you going to multiply grace? How are you going to expand on grace? The much more of grace, Romans 5.15, Romans 5.17, and verse 20. Now, not only does Paul write about the much more of grace? He's going to put whipped cream on top of the icing now. <laughs> and to the words much more, he adds the words abounded, verse number 15, abundance, verse number 17, and abound in verse 20. Verse 15 tells us, that what man did got him into trouble with God, but what God did and what God freely gave us more than just took care of that, it abounded. Yes. It did so much more than just canceled the past. So much more that it's hard to put into words. Even Paul, the, 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 the spokesman, the eloquent Paul, is struggling here. He can't find words in his vocabulary. Look at the extreme adjectives and adverbs he throws in. And he just keeps piling one on top of the other because he finds it impossible to say what he knows needs to be said and communicated. The greatness and the vastness of God's grace is ineffable. In verse 17, Paul points out the reason for our problem was Adam's sin. 
But the gift of abundant grace causes us to reign in life, not by the way we live our life, but because of God's gifts of grace and righteousness causes us to reign, not in heaven, but in life, but one Christ Jesus. Now, when you're asking God to cause you to reign in life over your circumstances, quit trying to bargain with Him. Quit trying to convince Him that you're good enough that He ought to bless you. No. Rather, remind God of His promise of much more abounding grace in Jesus. In Romans 5, 20 and 21, reminds us that no matter where, when, or how often sin raises its ugly head in our lives, that grace and God's gift of righteousness has already and much more and abundantly covered it all and provided all of our need in this life and in the life to come. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in Romans 8.37 we find the more than conquerors. You notice again that it says we are. That's present tense. Not we shall be when Jesus comes back. It says more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Now a conqueror has to go out into a contest or battle and best his enemy to be called a conqueror. But we haven't won anything in a contest. We're not in the position we're in because we conquered the flesh or because we conquered sin. In fact, we aren't even called upon to conquer. I've often tried to conquer sin because that's what I was taught I should do as a new believer and always failed miserably. And how, how depressing that is. I tried to conquer my flesh and guess what happened? I can't even seem to conquer Bejeweled or Candy Crush. Some conqueror, huh? So what does this more than conquerors really mean? I've heard many say that it means super conquerors. But think of this. The Bible doesn't call me a conqueror, not even a super conqueror. It calls me more than a conqueror or better than a conqueror or greater than a conqueror or above a conqueror. Now the king's armies go out and uh, they're in battle, and they conquer people for him. They conquer territory for him. They conquer protection or, or, or uh, possessions for him, and they protect all that he owns. But the king's sons inherit his without having to conquer anything. They're better than conquerors. They're greater than conquerors. They're more to conquerors than Him. They are His sons. And the Bible says I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I inherit freely as His Son all that He has conquered for me. I am more than a conqueror because all I have was freely given to me without having to conquer anything at all. Jesus conquered everything concerning me on the cross and then He cried out, It's finished. No more conquering to be done. Jesus tells me that all the conquering is done and all I have to do now is go out and pick up the spoils of His conquering and forget about trying to conquer that which has already been conquered for me and on my behalf. My call is to go out and possess my possessions. I'm an heir. Brother Walt Wagers used to say, I'd rather be an heir than a millionaire. Thank God for His much more abundant grace that has provided me with all I need and much more and abundantly. To Him alone be the glory in Christ Jesus our Lord forever and ever. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an heir of Him who conquered all. I inherit all that was conquered and all without my doing any conquering myself. That's the much more. This is better than being a conqueror. It's above being a conqueror. I didn't have to shed any of my blood. I didn't have to suffer any pain. I don't wear any battle scars. 
I didn't have to endure any test. I didn't have to outdo anyone else to receive my inheritance. It's one of the much mores of God's justification, God's reconciliation, God's salvation, God's grace, and God's mercy, and God's conquering. Paul put a footnote to all of this in his letter to the Ephesian believers. Listen what he wrote in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Again, he struggles for words. Every time he talks about God and His grace, he struggles for words. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of God which passes knowledge. Paul said, I wish I could say that. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can think according to the power of God that works within us. Now Paul is saying, you need to know these things for your own benefit. You need to know that your salvation isn't dependent upon you and what you can do for God, but rather upon what God has done for you and what God is doing in you. You need to know that your standing, your well-being, your care, your future depends upon what God has done for you and not what you can do for Him. You need to know that God's love has committed His goodness to you now as well as in the future. You need to know that God has committed His faithfulness to you no matter how unfaithful you might prove to be to Him. You need to know that God has much more for you than you have ever yet received. You need to know that everything you need has been secured for you and is in Christ. You need to know that the only thing you need to get in on all of this is to trust in Him. You need to know that God is faithful and will complete the work that He has begun in you and it's not up to you to complete. You need to know that God will never leave you, forsake you, and and nothing will ever be able to separate you from His love. Amen. <clears throat> Someone told me just the other day, I know God will never walk away from me, but He said, I'm afraid I've walked away from Him. I said, would you care to explain to me how that's possible? How it is you can walk away from someone who said He'll never leave you nor forsake you? How can you leave someone who won't let you leave him? Yeah, Often in life, I've walked away and later discover that I left something behind. I've left my car keys behind. I, I intended to take a book back to a friend just the other day, and I was getting ready to go. I laid the book out on the counter where I'd have to go buy it as I was leaving. I saw the book laying there on the counter just a few minutes before I left. But you know what? I packed up, went out the door, and when I got to where I was going, I remembered that book laying on that counter in the kitchen. Oftentimes, Maggie will make lunch for me take the work the next day and she'll say your lunch is in the refrigerator now if you want to take it to work tomorrow <laughs> I get to work and I think about that good lunch sitting in the refrigerator I walked right out of the house and left it I told her recently I said if you're putting something in there for me put a note on the counter where the book was so I can forget the note and the lunch Every Thursday morning, the trash man comes to pick up trash. I've been guilty once, more than once of paying that fee to have that trash man come and have nothing at the curb waiting for him. Sometimes Maggie will set the trash out by the last door that I go out, and I go out there and push that trash over so I can get out the door. <laughs> My mind's elsewhere. Walk right out of the house. 
But you know what? Never in my life have I ever gone anywhere and when I got there said, oh, 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 I can't believe it. I left my liver at home. I've never left my liver or kidney anywhere that I've gone because my liver is a part of me. If I go, my liver goes because my liver is one with me. The Bible said we're members of His body, of His flesh, and His bone. Christ is in you, His life is now one with your life. If your life goes, His life goes. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Some people often say there's nothing that God can't do, and I don't know what they mean by that, but I disagree with it. There are some things that God can't do. God cannot tell a lie. God cannot break a promise. God cannot leave you once you've been made one with Him and you cannot leave Him who is part and parcel of the very being that you now are. Do you know these things? If you don't, then you're still probably bound with the restraints of fear and doubt and worry. But if you just come to know these things, then freedom would be yours to enjoy. Well, preacher, how do I get to know them? Well, you go to the record and you fact check and you fact check and you read and you read and you read and you read until the light begins to shine and you begin to grasp the concepts that are there. And when you know it, doubt and fear and worry will go out to the window. I promise you that on the authority of the Word of God. Now all of this is pointed at the believer in Christ. And the only way it can apply to you if you're not a believer is for you to cross over that line of faith and put your trust in Jesus. And with Jesus, God freely gives you all of this and so much more. John wrote in John 17, 3, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, that they might experience thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 1 John 5, 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. He that believeth not, God has made him a liar, because he believed not the record note that word record that God gave of his son and this is the record that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he that hath the son life has life he that has not the son of God has not life these things have written to you that believe on the name of son of God that you may know knowing comes through believing that you may know that you have eternal life present tense just suppose back years ago, when our children were, were still small, that if I'd got a wild hair and just run off and deserted Mag and the boys, I just decided I didn't want to be married anymore. And so I left and was gone for several years. But one day I returned and Mag found I was back. So she goes to the courts and files papers with the courts on me for desertion and child support. The case comes before the judge and we're both there. The judge asked me, Mr. Mundy, are you married to this woman? Now because I've been living a single life for a while, I might respond, Your Honor, I don't feel married anymore. But she protests that we are still married. And there you have the classic scenario of he said, she said. Does that cause the judge a dilemma, a problem? Of course not. He simply tells the bailiff to contact the Tennessee Department of Records for a marriage license with the name George Mundy and Margaret Castile. And when the judge has the record in hand, when the judge has the document in front of him, then he rules on the written record and he says, Mr. Mundy, I see by the record that you are married to this woman no matter how you may feel about it. The judge renders his verdict based upon the record and nothing else. 
John said God's ghost, but the written record when he executing his verdicts. The Bible said believers' names are indelibly written in the Lamb's book of life. And when you trust Jesus, then your name is written in that book. And in Revelation says that when God renders a verdict on the, every, the life of every man at the end of the age, it'll be according to what's written in the books. Revelation said the books were brought forth and men were judged by the things written in in the books. John said these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. So do you know? If not, why not? You can know. And if you don't know, it's your own fault because God in the Bible, as I pointed out this morning, leaves no uncertainty about it. And if you don't believe the Bible, it's probably because you're listening more to your own feelings or lack of feelings, or you're listening to the world's philosophy or the devil's lies. Yeah. The devil is the father of lies, and Jesus is the truth. Amen. So which will you believe? It's your choice. And choices always have consequences. Now, this thing of believing, faith. Faith is more about what you take a stand on. It's more about that than it is about a thought or a concept you just hold in your mind. When a person purchases a lottery ticket, they know the odds, but it's because they believe there is the chance they might win even though they have some doubts. So which one out? Their faith or their doubts? Well, if they bought the ticket, it's because faith won out over their doubts. And when a person asks Jesus to save them, it's almost always with some doubts still in their minds. But faith won out, and your move toward God is evidence that your faith won out in spite of your doubts. Lord, I believe, help mine unbelief. He had belief and he had doubts. But Jesus honored the faith that he had. He responded to the faith that he had, not the faith that he didn't have. What faith you do have brought you to Jesus and he said, He that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out any faith. Any faith brings you to Jesus. More faith comes through growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't ask the two blind men if they believed that He would do for them what they asked. He simply asked if they believed that He was able to do it. And so I ask you this morning, do you believe God is able to do everything He's promised? I'm not saying that you personally lay a claim to everything that God's promised and you own it and possess it. But do you believe He's able to do it? Do you believe He's able to do it? Or do you believe that He's lied? It's important what you believe and it's important what you act upon, your faith or your doubts. What action you take reveals the true faith that you have you would not have even bothered to ask Jesus to save you in the first place unless you believed that He would in spite of your doubts. So just how do we get in on this great, great life? Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that a man must be born again. Nicodemus was a very well-educated man. Jesus acknowledged that he was a master. He was at the, the top of the heap in knowledge. Very well-educated. And so... He asked Jesus a question from a rational, reasonable mind. He said, can a man enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? People are born from their mother's womb. And so if this process was to reoccur, then it must happen again the same way it happened the first time. If it didn't, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be termed again. Again means a second time. Does that make sense to anyone but me? Yeah. Again. Same thing over. Now, Jesus didn't deny the concept that Nicodemus put forth. What He did was He changed pages on Nicodemus. And He said, Nicodemus, I'm not talking about a rebirth of the flesh. I'm not talking about a rebirth 
of the human body. I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth. Second birth. The second birth, there had to be a first one. The human body was conceived, created, and birthed from the mother's womb. And if you want to do it over, uh, if you, uh, then it would have to reoccur after the same manner. Now, <coughs> excuse me. In the original creation, the spiritual man was born not from the womb of God, but from the heart of God. His life came from the heart of God. His being as an individual was born from God's heart and was in God's own likeness. God breathed His own breath, His own life into this body of clay and the man became a living soul with the life that God had. He was born from the life of heart, uh, life of, and the heart of God with the likeness. That's where man got his life. But Adam walked away from that love and was thus alienated from God's heart. In order for man to then be born again, then he must somehow re-enter the, uh, the heart of God and this comes by faith. God gives him a rebirth. God restores that spiritual life. He's now a new creature, a second birth child of God. Colossians, Colossians 3 says the new man is renewed. Done again in the knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. He was born a second time from the same place and in the same manner that He was born the first time from the heart of God. He enters a second time into the Father's heart and is born again. And <clears throat> with this new birth comes new life. And this time it's eternal life. Now, believers aren't perfect as to their humanity. And almost everyone worries about being able to live the Christian life when you approach them and ask them about receiving Christ into their life. I know I was concerned about that. Oh, I'm afraid I can't live it. And I know everyone has met someone or heard some believer criticize some other Christian for the way they live or do not live their lives. And from that we conclude that salvation is somehow earned by doing these good things. But that's not the issue here if you're considering re receiving Christ as your own Lord and Savior. My oldest son loves Rottweiler dogs. He's had, I think, at least three different ones. And so I'm familiar with these big lumbering animals. But when he got the last one, it was just a small pup. And he called me and said, just a few weeks old, he called me and said, hey, I just got this new Rottweiler pup a couple of days ago, and I had already planned a trip away from me and my family this weekend. I need someone to watch the pup. Well, guess who got elected to puppy sit for the weekend? So Ozzie and I were spending Saturday together, and I watched this little dog, and I was just amazed at him. They're doing all these things. He was blundering around like he owned the place. He was bouncing off of things. Uh, he was uh, uh, stumbling over his own feet and mine, falling on his face. And I sat there observing all of this and thinking, of all things... John took off and left me with this brand new pup and he didn't even leave me a handbook to teach him how to become a Rottweiler. I need to be training him how to behave so when he behaves right, he somehow becomes a Rottweiler. How thoughtless is of him? Now that's a little facetious. But you see, what I really observed was that he didn't need any training. I was amazed to watch this little pup acting just like the big full-grown dog. He didn't need any training to know how to behave because he had Rottweiler life in him. He was naturally acting like a Rottweiler even though he had no knowledge of that. He had Rottweiler life and Rottweiler DNA in him and that Rottweiler... Rottweiler life was manifesting itself through him. He didn't need any training to learn how to be what he already was. 
The life he possessed was living out its life through his body. And friends, isn't it ludicrous for us to think that when the living God of heaven enters a person and brings his own life into that life that the God living in that person now needs a handbook of instruction written by Moses or needs other believers to teach God living in me how to live out his life through me. God within lives out His life in each believer according to the personality, gifting, knowledge, and experience that He's gifted that life with. When Jesus enters a life, then Jesus is living in that life, His own life, and that life in time will manifest itself may not be according to the way that you should think it should be, may not be according to the timing that you think it should be, may not be the way uh, that He lives out His life in you. But if God lives in your life, He does indeed live out His life through you. Christianity is not a matter of you learning to live like or act like God so you can become His child. It's a matter of you inviting the living God God of the universe to come and live out His life through you, through your human spirit, through your human mind, and through your human body. And so I ask you these morning, do you know these things? Do you know God through the second birth? If you don't, then today is the day and this is the place for you to be born again and to enter in the life of peace, joy, and fulfillment that God wants for you as His dearly loved child to enjoy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you believe? That's the all-important question. Let's stand to our feet.